for that. Are you ready? Let's do this. Okay, so first a uh, short introduction. Um, welcome to Project Banner. This is episode 48 of my blog. Uh, documentation of my journey as a content creator towards working at Banner Media in New York City. And today I'm in Denver. I'm sitting here with Joe Mentz. What's going on? Welcome to the vlog. Thank you. Appreciate you having me. So yeah, just start off with uh, telling us a little bit about yourself and what you do. Sure, right. Um, so I'm a public speaker for a Fortune 500 company. Um, you know, I speak on a range of different curriculums and I've been expanding my skill set outside of the typical corporate environment the last uh, year or so. and in gearing up my presence and my brand on uh, social media, working on a book, a couple podcasts, I'm launching a few businesses that way. I'm all about you know helping folks get from where they're at to where they want to go, and uh, you know I call that one leveling up. I'm big on that. I've been very fortunate uh, with how I got here. Um, I used to cut hair for about five years, needed a few hip surgeries, couldn't stand on my feet anymore, and I went to this uh, extremely um, popular Fortune 500 company. After I taught myself, you know, the technical trade and said, hey, I taught myself how to, uh, uh, you know, I learned how to cut hair. Hair with women's emotional. Uh, money's emotional. I taught myself, you know, your technical side of the job and, and give me a job. And, and that works. And five and a half later, five and a half years later, here's where I'm at. And I want to take my game to the, uh, to the next level and start helping some retail folks. I feel I was pretty fortunate in not having to go the traditional route and spend a bunch of money on school and then traditional education. I'm a student of the market, if you will, and kind of self-taught in a lot of areas. And I have some Ivy League schools doing some uh, research studies on me um, now with some of the work that we've done. So it feels pretty cool. And now I want to give back and help other folks be the hero of, the hero of their own story. I feel that we're all kind of you know, living a story and, and we're writing a book. You, know, you want to make that book as interesting as you can is the goal. And how do you do that? Um, you know, I think that's what we're going to talk about today you know, yeah. on a pragmatic technical level. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, as we talked about uh, before, we uh, wanted to have like a subject for this live, mm -hmm. uh, and we talked a little bit on Friday about like setting goals and having a structure to reach those goals. Mm -hmm. um, so, I wanted to talk about that in this live episode, and I think a good start is just to. Um, Explain a little bit why I'm sitting here and how we got in contact. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's a pretty yeah. cool story, right? I mean, that's the power of social media right there. Yeah, right? Mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. So do you want to? Sure. I mean, it was, uh, I think I found you, you know, going through Gary Vee stuff. Somehow, maybe you liked a post or a comment or you were on his followers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I clicked on your, um, your page and at the very top, what does your bio say? Um, my bio says uh, goal is to work for Gary Vaynerchuk in New York City. And that's someone that I've really kind of looked up to over the last year. You know, he's inspired me with a number of things. So I'm like, hey, if you want to, you know, film for this guy, I want to put out content similar to this guy, like, let's collaborate. And so that just goes to show you, like, writing your goals out there, putting it out there to the world, no matter how big they are. Like, if someone sees it, then this could happen. I mean... We could have gone our whole lives and never met each other. This is just yeah. wild that this happened all because of social media and because of that one sentence that you put right there. Mm -hmm. And that's really how it started. I sent you a DM. We connected a few times. And I said, hey, I would love to collaborate. And uh, next thing we know, we got you to fly the 4,000 miles out to Denver mm -hmm. and kind of you know, record a lot of the stuff that, uh, that we're doing out here in Denver. And, and yeah. it's a wild story. Yeah. And uh, I think it's like a lot of small things that are connected to when you're setting up goals and how to reach them. I agree. So both that we talked about with uh, writing down what your goal is True. and uh, telling other people about it. Uh, but if we go back even further, you have to like crystallize that for yourself. Like what is the actual goal and, mm -hmm. and specify what you want to reach. Right. And, and then like telling yourself that um, this is something that I really want to do and trying to like have um, see yourself in that situation. Um, so I think it's a, a lot of things like mentally connected there to writing it down, telling people about it, and, like uh, almost visualize 
you be you in to. that have place? To. Right, yeah. Couldn't agree more. I listened to Steve Jobs' 2004 keynote speech at Stanford, and what he said was, you know, he dropped out. If you don't know about Steve Jobs, founder of Apple, right, he dropped out of college, and it was a big deal because he was adopted, and his parents, his original parents said, make sure the parents who adopted him, make sure Steve's got to go to school. He's got to go to college. So it was a big deal. And so he dropped out, and when he dropped out, he just started auditing classes, so taking classes for free, not getting credit for them necessarily, but the things that he was interested in, like a calligraphy class and a history class on this that he wasn't eligible to take, and this, that, and the other thing. And he said, you know, 2004, looking back on those decisions, you know, Apple is what it was today or is today because all he did at that point was what he was interested in. You know, and you can't connect the dots looking forward. When he dropped out, he was like, what am I doing? I feel like I'm wasting, uh, you know, my parents' money, my time. I'm not sure. You know, I'm kind of struggling. But he said, looking forward, the dots don't connect. But looking back, they all do connect. And so for goal setting, I think everyone, you know, has obligations, right? You got to get up. You have your job. You have to eat. You got, you know, maybe you're a parent. You got uh, siblings you look after or other responsibilities you got to take care of. And and at the end of the day, at the end of the week, you really only have like an extra hour a day. You know, you got eight hours of sleep roughly. Uh, you know, you can cut that down to six if you want. But you got eight hours to work. You got to commute. You have some downtime. You want to watch your Netflix or do whatever, right? And, and you need that. Like, you know, but you still have that hour at the very least at the end of the day, each day, which is seven hours a week. And all you have to do is whatever you're interested in. And that leads to the next thing, what leads to the next thing, what leads to the next thing. And then looking back, it all connects. You know, I remember after I was cutting hair and got my few hip surgeries, I had an interest in the market. So I taught myself how to do that. And I was, you know, did some public speaking courses at that time and taught myself how to do that. And then moved, you know, locations and for whatever reason. And then met somebody next door across the hall that was doing something similar, which, you know, allowed me to meet a team that was doing something you know, similar down in Phoenix, which got me to follow kind of Gary Vee, which got me to, you know, let so it all does connect. So in essence, all you got to do is whatever you're interested in and stick with it. Consistency always beats out intensity. You know, you hear there's so many people out there that say, you got to, you know, wake up at five, four in the morning. You got to put in the six hours a day. And yeah, that's great. And I think you can and you should, but it's not realistic. You don't stick with your goals when you do that, right? I mean, that's the quickest way to fall off the bandwagon and fail, and you look back and you say, man, you know, another year's passed and all these things that I wanted to do, I haven't done any of it. And I think it's we set these unrealistic expectations. At the beginning, we want to. We say this one's going to be different. We promise it's going to be different, and it's not. You know, and then we look internally, and then we find some new motivation or we buy a new product or a good or a service thinking that's going to fix our issue, and frankly, it doesn't, you know? Mm -hmm. And everyone wants to get to the top, but... You know, so few really look at like it's the journey. I know you, to the point you mentioned, you really have to believe that you will get there. There's a book out there called um, you like The Miracle of Thinking Big. And that says your level of success uh, matches how much confidence you have. Right. And so if that's the case, you have to believe and see yourself and feel yourself in that moment, whatever that is, and meditate on that. That's something from Dr. Do Joe Dispenza, right? Not just saying it out loud and thinking what it'll feel like or what it's going to sound like or what it'll look like, but what you will feel like when you get there. But, um, you know, after all of that is done, right? I mean, at the end of the day, like, that's the mindset piece. And then it's just putting the time away consistently. And, and build the momentum up, right? That's the ticket that everyone wants to try and do. Everyone wants to, like, flip the switch and go from zero to 100 real quick, right? To quote Drake on that one. But... It's really about just forming habits. You fall victim to your processes, and if you don't succeed, it's because your habits are unrealistic, in my opinion. So, you know, it's kind of a rant, but in essence, like, you hear all these successful people, and it seems like all these different things, and really it boils down to the same two things. It's visualize what it'll feel like when you get there uh, to increase the confidence or increase your mental mindset. Plan for failure. That's the only sure thing of when achieving, you know, your goals, you're going to hit that. Plan for what are you going to do when that failure hits instead of what am I going to do to start? And then lastly, just put in consistent time. And you talked about it the other day, and I love it, is at the end of the week, you have to sit down and reflect and ask yourself the mm -hmm. tough question and say, if, if my goal is X, did I win the week or lose the week? 
right? And most of the time, you'll be negatively surprised when you do that, right? And once you do that, you find yourself subconsciously making better decisions to put good time in towards those goals next week. Because it doesn't even have to be an hour at a time. You can sit down and do, you know, five minutes here and 10 minutes here and 15 minutes here. And then it starts to become a part of you. And then that's where it takes off because it's not a job that you have to sit down for. Yeah. And I, I think it's like I was thinking of kind of a, a model to follow mm -hmm. um, because a lot of people talk about hard work. And, of course, that's a big part of it. But I'm thinking like there are three things that you have to do like all the time. And that is to. Uh, test, reflect, and improve. Test, reflect, and what do you mean so by test? Test by, that's actually basically the hard work. Okay. So mm -hmm. doing the things that you need to do to reach your goals. Right. And then reflect over are you doing the right things? Mm -hmm. Are you getting the results that mm -hmm. you want? Optimizing, you told yeah, me. Yeah, then day. optimizing, right. improving. So mm -hmm. like going through that circle like mm -hmm. weekly mm -hmm. to always go forward mm -hmm. and always improve so you can adjust along the way. Right. So I think that's really important. I agree. Yeah, I mean the test, right? The hard work. It's funny. We were having a conversation about the other day. Hard work is the easiest part of it, right? Because you just show up and do it. That's like, that's your proof of purchase that you have to pay your ticket for entry for doing that. I don't know that it should be called hard work. It's just like put in the time. And then what most folks don't do is the last two parts that you said, which is reflect by asking yourself that tough question. And look at, again, you're seeing consistency. This is what Ray Dalio said. This is what a bunch of other successful people say. You're saying the same thing. It all sounds different, but it's really the same thing. Test, put in the work. Reflect, and then at the end of the week, sit down with no one around. What you're saying, I, I believe, is ask yourself a tough question. Did you win the week? Did you lose the week? And how can you improve? Yeah. And then if you lost, where did you lose and why did you lose? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, optimize that a little bit. You know, and if you do those three things consistently week over week, you're going to build up that momentum, which I guarantee you at the end of three weeks, you'll be a slightly different person. You'll have slightly different skill sets, and you'll look back, and you'll feel better about yourself rather than, hey, I have this huge arduous goal. I'm only going to be happy once I get to that goal. No, like with trust and embrace the process, the small reflections, you know, along the way, like that's really where it's fun in my opinion. Yeah, and yeah. I, I think like the, the power of having good habits mm -hmm. is something that I have underestimated before. Yeah. Like I've always wanted to like reach uh, goals and have things I wanted to accomplish in short amount of time right. instead of looking at the things I'm doing on a daily basis and how that affects me. Right. Like winning five minutes here and there, if you add them up together, it's a lot of time that you ah. can win in a year. Right, that's and, a good point. And right. I think that one good example of the, like, uh, the circle that I'm mm -hmm. talking about mm -hmm. is uh, how you're doing with reading mm -hmm. because that's something that you do like on a regular basis mm -hmm. and then you... Um, yeah, talk with a friend that also reads the same books and right. reflect over that. Yep. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure, sure. So this is a buddy of mine's goal, um, Paul Arsenal, one of the hardest working, coolest, creative guys I know. He wanted to read 40 books over the course of a year. And the first time he told me about it, I thought it was awesome, but I was like, ah, I'm not really interested. I don't feel like I'm a good reader. I can't stay focused to sit down and read through a whole book. But I like the idea of it. So what he does is he reads the book. He's got nine days to read the book. I read the same book every day as well. But I use my phone, right, because here's some power right here if you're using it right. I go on this app, Blinkist, and it condenses a book down to a very short audio book that you can listen to in maybe 10, 15 minutes. And so I listen to the same audio book that he's listening to, but I listen to the Blinkist version, which is a condensed version of the book and basically boils it down to the main themes or main points. And I listen to the same book every day for nine days. And then at the end of the nine days, we get together and we, you know, discuss what we've learned and how we applied it. So that's the one thing is I, I listen to the same thing every day. It's too many folks, it really like gets to me when you hear something that you've heard before and folks will interrupt like, oh yeah, yeah, I know that. Let me show you my experiences. Like, I think that's one of the worst things that we can do. You have twice as many ears as you do a mouth. We should listen twice as much as we talk. And so that's why I listen to the same book. I listen to the exact same 15-minute thing again and again and again and again and again. Because even if I listen to it once and I remember it tomorrow, that's not my goal. My goal is to remember it a year from now when I forget 
that I've read that book and I'm not even going to pick it up. And I need whatever principle that book talked about to help overcome this obstacle. So that's why I have that repetition. If someone talks to me about something that I've done or heard or know, I just pretend like it's the first time I've ever heard it. I mean, if we, if we read a book two times in a row, you clearly pick up something different the second time. But let's talk about something more obvious. I'm sure you've watched the same movie or show multiple times. So if you are willing to sit through the same movie two or three times and be entertained, why can't you sit through what someone else is saying, even though you technically know it, and be open to learning something that you didn't hear before, letting it stink, you know, sink in a little bit? So we do that, and then at the end of it, we discuss you know, what we learned and how we applied it. And that's the biggest thing, because honestly, it doesn't mean shit if we can talk about it, but can't apply it. So how we apply it is we build like a manifesto or manuscript, if you will, and we condense and boil the big points down, down to what we call a one-pager. We got this one from Tim Ferriss. I really like it. It's basically taking all the central themes of that book and condensing it to a one-pager um, and a few notes or bullet points with an infographic format. But then we start a new book, again, for the next nine days. And then after that, we boil those notes from that one-pager and we see if we can connect them to this one pager. And so now everything we're starting to synthesize and it's becoming one central theme of everything that we've learned. And what we found is that a lot of these successful books, whether it's Selling, whether it's Carnegie, whether it's Simon Sinek, whether it's uh, you know Good Fit, like any of these guys, it's whether it's Ray Dalio, they all use different words, but they're all getting to the same thing. And once you hear that, for me, it's a lot easier to know what I got to do to be successful. It's not a bunch of other stuff out there. It's the same stuff, you know? And that's why originally I was turned off by the book because I classify myself as a world expert on world experts. I mean, I'm a speaker. And although I haven't been through the experiences that a lot of these, you know, highly, highly successful people have, um, you know, I can embody what they do and I can speak to it and I can draw on the parallels between them. And then being what, what I do for a living, which is, you know, influence folks and, and download or upload new information or software to people's brains. I take what I know what's out there and I synthesize it into a simple format. And then that's my gift to people. And that's ultimately what I'm trying to do outside of my company because it's, you know, I do good when I feel good. And, and uh, I like people to become the heroes of their own story. And, and you just need to unlock a certain portion of their brain to do some of that. And so the best way to do that is through wisdom. And wisdom is defined as learning through other people's experiences without having to go through the failures yourself. You just move a little bit quicker that way. Yeah, I think that it comes down to two things. Uh, first is like optimizing. Mm -hmm. When you're reading a lot of books, you see similarities of a lot of successful people mentioning the same thing that then it probably works. Right. Just that they use different words to describe it. Mm -hmm. uh, and also uh, because you said that you are listening to Blinkist and he's reading the book. Mm -hmm. um, and that um, comes down to self-awareness as well because um, you different people learn different ways. Like right. people, um, some people learn better by watching or reading mm -hmm. or actually doing it, being practical. Mm -hmm. practical. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, I think it's really good to do it nine times in a row because... Right. I read somewhere that like I think you remember like 20% from mm. uh, from reading something yeah the Ebbinghaus so, forgetting curve yeah that's an yeah so one. if you just do it more and more you maybe can pick up those few things that you missed from the start and like right. see where are the good parts from the, the book that I'm going to bring with me true so you yeah. don't just read it and drop it because I I've noticed myself that a lot of time I'm like watching tutorials and I'm reading stuff and like I'm consuming a lot of things and thinking that uh, only that will make me more educated and give me more knowledge mm -hmm. but I actually have to convert that into making something of it. So true. I mean we're in the information age, right? I forget the quote out there but it's like how much information is put out on the internet each day is like more information than you know, I, I forget what the statistic was, but it's mind blowing, right? So mm -hmm. there's more information, there's more to read, but our brains don't read any faster, mm -hmm. you know? So like, even if you get that information, what do you do with it? That's all that matters, right? You can be the smartest person in the room, but if you don't do anything with it, then what's the point? 
And that's where I feel pretty fortunate is, Grant, I didn't go to school. I didn't have the opportunity to do some of that stuff, but I was just always about, I learned something, I implement. Execute, learn, implement. What's the minimum effective dose? Cool, how can I implement that, right? And that's yeah. where the rubber meets the road. We can, again, sit here and talk about goal setting all day and all these you know, great, big, grandiose things, but when it comes down to it, what do you actually do with this information? If we can't give you some actionable insight, then you know, we wasted your time and ours as well. And what I look at that is, I, uh, so I'll use a simple example. I want to get in better shape, so I want to do push-ups, right? And for the longest time, I wanted to do 100 push-ups a day. But what I found is, that was a goal I had for years, and I never accomplished it. Mm. You know, and it wasn't until, you know, a few months ago, and a buddy challenged me, because we'd be, you know, doing some push-ups throughout the day. He's like, and we would, every time we do 10 push-ups, we put an X on the board. X on the board, X on the board, X on the board. And he came up with the idea, he's like, why don't you just do 400 push-ups a week? And I'm like, okay, that's kind of cool. And so now, like, anytime I do a set of 10, or sometimes I'm feeling a little better, I'll do 20, um, you know, I go and put an X on a post-it note, mark it down. At the end of the week, all I got to do is get to 400. And what that allows for is for you to break down your week in a few different parts. Because my weeks, granted, I start a work week on Monday, but it starts on Saturday for me. And what I found is there's three three locations of your work week. There's the Sunday, Monday, and this is if you work a traditional Monday through Friday. Sunday, Mondays are like kind of rough. You get the Sunday scaries, you know, the taste of the Mondays. People aren't really feeling it. And so on Mondays, like I don't have huge expectations of myself. My goal is to get in and get in the right mindset and revitalize on Sunday. And then Monday, get in and like connect with my people. Um, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday is when I get the lion's share of my work done. Wednesday, like I'm really crushing it. Tuesday, I'm gearing up. Thursday, you know, I'm really crushing it. Friday and Saturday, it's own thing, right? You're excited for the weekend. That's more for yourself, right? And so I've broken down my week into those three parts. And so I know like if there's specific workflows or things I got to do, I don't try and do them on the wrong part of that week, right? And for that reason, I don't try and do 100 push-ups every day. Because like Sunday or Monday, I'm not feeling it. Sometimes Saturday, I get too busy with just all the stuff that I'm doing. But, you know, my Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, consistently, I'm like right there. And sometimes I bring my Friday into that or my Monday or do push-ups on Sunday. I'm not saying that, but, you know, you break down your week like that. And now you know, okay, I got to do these things during this time. And this is like Tony Robbins, right? The wheel of life, right? If your life is a wheel, right, you have all these spokes on the wheel, for example. And one of those spokes could be your personal life, like your mindset, your your spiritual Another one is like your relationships. Maybe you're a, you're a spouse, you're married, right? You're a parent. Maybe you're a coach, you're an employee, right? All these part of the different tribes that you are, right? These are all spokes on a wheel. And for a wheel to work, all the spokes have to be equal distance, right? You don't have one spoke, right? That's your social life. It's two feet long, but then your career life is two inches long. And then your personal is, you know, half an inch long. But then this area is, you know, six feet long. Like a wheel doesn't move forward. They all have to be balanced, right? Which means throughout the week, you have to work on all of those things to be successful. You have to work on your mental game. You have to do some stuff for yourself. You have to say no to other people sometimes. And then you do have to get some stuff done for work. And then you do have the important people in your life that you have to put time and energy towards. And sometimes you'll be tired. But at the end of the week, you ask yourself the questions and say, okay, what are the spokes on the wheel that I have? And for me, it's like I have my personal. I have uh, my friends and family. I have my work, and then I have the stuff I'm trying to do outside of my work week, or the other businesses that I'm launching. And so when I sit down and have that radical transparency, you got that one from Ray Dalio in the book Principles, great book to read, is uh, I sit down and radically candor or radically transparent with myself and say, hey, if those are the four areas of my life that are important to me, for my wheel to move forward, all four of those have to be invested in, and I have to grease those parts of the wheel and spend time there. Did I win or lose each part of those weeks in those areas? And sometimes you win two or four. Sometimes you go three for four. Sometimes you go one for four, and that's okay. But spending the time to ask yourself creates the balance long term. And again, you are a wheel, and so that wheel wants to move forward. But it's not going to move forward if you just invest all your time into your side hustle. It's not going to move forward if you spend all your time working for your company and it's all about money, right? Because then your relationship marriage, your relationships with your kids may fail. Um, so you have to spend time on all of them. And balance is the name of the game. And that's why I say at the end of the day, you only, only have an hour. And people say, yes, you know, you, you can 
get up at 5 a.m. and you can have time for this. And it's like, yes, you can, but then you're only investing in one aspect of that wheel, and that wheel isn't going to move forward very long if you continue to keep that up. It's consistency that beats out intensity. That's one that, you know, Bruce Lee, that was one of his quotes, and I try and live by that quote um, as much as I can. It's easy, though. The wheel gets off balance, but what matters is, you know, month over month, did you see some progress in all of those areas? Yeah. You know, right? And I think it's the, like, the work-life balance that people talk about. Right. I think it's a lot of times that's misunderstood because mm -hmm. people just, co like, compare work and um, when you're at home. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's it's really those four areas that you were talking about. Right. And also, um, like, seeing what's the best balance for you like mm -hmm. there is isn't a model that suits everyone mm -hmm. true and you got to find it yourself you know i've created you look i got you know to post it notes i got whiteboards i got you know calendars on my phone i've got calendars i keep in paper right like the only way i've that created this is like i reflected over the week like you mm -hmm. said i optimize and say hey keeping my calendar on my phone doesn't work for me i need to keep my calendar on paper i do this thing called bullet journaling I like to have post-it notes up there. I like to have whiteboards here. That works for me. My house is conducive to that. I got a nice view. I like to see the sun. If I don't see the sun, I don't have as much energy. You know, navigating or working from home, I have all these you know, things I can do to stay fit around here. You're, you're so right. You gotta make it work for yourself. And you can look outside and ask a bunch of people, but ultimately you have to look back, reflect, change. Reflect, reflect, change. And the only way I've got to this point with optimizing my life is I went to the wrong areas in a bunch of different ways. I over-optimized it. I over-engineered. You know, there was this thing called a habit stack that I implemented. I used to wake up at 5 in the morning, and I would do, you know, two language lessons. I would learn, like, Spanish and German, and then I'd do piano lessons, and I'd do some vocal lessons. Then I'd work out. Then I'd read the paper. Then I'd listen to a Blinkist. Then I'd brush my teeth with my non-dominant hand to wake up. Then I'd work out. Then I would, uh, you know, do a little meditation and like I would stack it and then throughout the day I would do this entertainment thing with this other thing or the other thing and like it was just too uh, over engineered. And so I've got elements of those now present, but what's realistic for me in the way I live my life? Yeah. And uh, like for me, for example, I'm, I'm putting everything down on my phone mm -hmm. and you have like post-it notes. Mm -hmm. So that's also back to self-awareness, like right. what works for you mm -hmm. and what works for another people, mm -hmm. person. Uh, and also like the balance that you have during the week it can also be like the balance over a whole year right like when I look back to when I was playing hockey and I I tried to like uh, I was schedule scheduling every practice and what I needed to learn and uh, like from week to week mm -hmm. and what I've noticed is it's it takes one year to mm -hmm. actually know how to optimize it better because really? yeah huh. because it can be like you can have four weeks in a row that it's no problem everything yeah. like works perfectly yeah and then you come to like one month that is really hard like for me it's october right because it's really dark and it's the beginning of the season it's right. a lot of hard training yeah so then maybe i have to adjust the training during that month mm -hmm. and maybe train harder in like december or january mm, to make up for yeah that's so that's funny again with the consistent themes you know my sister um marissa she told me when i was first learning how to cut hair and like i can't believe i, I learned how to do that my older sister jessica sold me on that industry i feel like i blacked out woke up six months later in hair school like what am i doing i used to play basketball and now i got to learn how to do hair and women's updos and you know stuff like that for weddings like i didn't know you know how to get better and she gave me this advice that i still operate off of to this day which is similar to what she said she said joey it's going to take you two years. First year, first year to get good, and then the second year to get fast. Okay. I'm like, right? So it takes you a year to figure out how you can even optimize it, which means you just have to do it for a year, reflect along the way, but then at the end of that next year, then you can start to optimize and look at it like, okay, during this time I fall off, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, if you have the goals for yourself in December that you do in October, you're going to feel like a, a failure in October, mm -hmm. when really you should realize that, hey, it gets darker earlier uh, in October. I don't have the same sort of mental bandwidth or physical energy that I do. So I reduce my goals of like, for example, you know, working on my stuff for seven hours a week down to two and a half. And that's a win. You know, and if you can do that, that's consistency. The wheel continues to move forward. Yeah. I think it's really interesting also how you can like find ways to uh, 
to optimize and to be productive and to, to learn mm -hmm. in different areas. Yeah. Like for me, when I started with video editing two mm -hmm. years ago, mm -hmm. I tried to like, uh, I tried to use the things that I've learned from playing ice hockey, but I mm -hmm. noticed that it was a lot of things that was hard to like convert to video editing. Mm -hmm. So uh, then I like kind of started over with like the two year period that you talked about and I look at the first year like just collecting data like documenting uh, what I do mm -hmm. what are uh, that's good what are like uh, uh, the goals that I actually can reach and mm -hmm. what are too high and what do I need to focus on true and then actually optimizing it on the second year so now after doing it for two years mm -hmm. now I have a little better control over mm -hmm. okay now I know what I'm capable of doing right. it one month or one week right right exactly so, I call that like building a learning receipt right mm -hmm. like anything you buy in life you get a receipt for it right so if you want to learn a new skill in your case video editing right you're starting and you write down two years ago when you started you know write down everything you know about video editing and it may have been in a few paragraphs right mm -hmm. or, or less than that or maybe sometimes for some of you watching it was nothing but you learn a few things, you add on a few things, you optimize, you add that to your learning receipt, <clears throat> and now everything you know about video editing slowly grows and compounds, right? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, in doing that process, instead of just leaving it all up here, you get it out on paper, and you can start to see where you need to go, because now with video editing, I mean, I look at all the equipment, the software you have, it's like, if you don't know what you're doing and reflecting, how are you gonna know where you wanna go next, right? Yeah. You know, you could just very easily get lost. The more you get into something, it's easy to, you know, go in a bunch of the, a bunch of different directions that are kind of competing, uh, and really, you know, you have a central goal that you want to get. And it's important to plant that flag on a hill and know where you want to go, right? Otherwise, you just wander aimlessly around because you know, with every industry, there's so much, right? I mean, just looking up, you know, the actual hard products for film and video editing, you can get lost in that right mm -hmm. there. I know that I've been down that path, right? So you know, maintain that focus. <clears throat> one of the things that I like to tell people to do is come up with a three-week sprint. You have this big goal. And so, for example, let's say you're starting out with video editing. Okay, what is that big goal that you want to do? And yours was, you know, you want to record for, uh, you know, VaynerMedia on a day-to-day -day mm -hmm. basis, right? So that's your long-term goal. And then if you start out with knowing nothing about video editing, right, what is something that you can do within three weeks? And it forces you to ask yourself what's realistic and what's not. Because when it's six months, you don't really know what's realistic. It's hard. Yeah. You set goals that are too big or too small. So three weeks, yeah. you can localize that a little bit better. And then, you know, try and incorporate that in your day-to-day. -day. And by day-to-day, -day, I mean like four days a week, right? Your Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or whenever you're really doing well. You know, you're getting into the rhythm of your week, right? So, and, and spending and knowing that you only really have an hour of that day, right? Can you spend a full hour... <clears throat> fully committed and focused to that thing? Likely no, right? I mean, there's only so long you can pay attention. It's about 45 minutes or 20 minutes, depending on the study that you reference. And so you're getting maybe two of those periods <clears throat> in a given day, four days a week, which we're looking at, you know, maybe three or four hours over the course of a week, two, um, you know, three weeks in a row. So we're talking nine hours. So you have to ask yourself, what can I accomplish? And nine hours is a lot of time if you do it right, right? <clears throat> Spending the right nine hours in the right place, do that for three weeks and hit that goal. And what you'll find is if you hit that goal at the end of three weeks, you'll be proud of yourself. You gain some momentum. And then take a week off, just like they do in school, right? You have your vacation or this or that. Take a few days off, reflect what's going to be your next three-week goal. Plant that flag on the hill. And now you start to see, okay, I have my big flag, which is, again, to record for VaynerMedia, right? And then you broke it down. What was your three-week goal? Cool, you hit that one. Now what's your next three-week goal again? Yeah. And now you're making sure you're navigating and going in the right direction. And I think mm -hmm. pragmatically and technically, that is how you actually achieve your goals, right? Because, again, we say a bunch of stuff, but you don't do anything different after you watch this video. It's great. So sit down after you watch this and say, okay, what's my big goal? All right, what's something I can accomplish within three weeks? Cool, what can I really accomplish that within about nine hours over the course of three weeks? And that's all you have to focus on. That is the first thing. And then you have your social life, your personal life, right? Your work life. You balance all those things and you're putting in time to hit that, that short-term flag. 
so that the wheel is staying on the, on the course or on track. And then in a few weeks, if you didn't fall off, because I've seen folk maybe study for a rigorous exam and that's the big focus for the next three weeks, then the social falls off, the family life falls off, the health falls off, and like everything fell off the rails. And so were they really successful? Would it not have been better to take six weeks for that and break it down into two, three week chunks and keep everything on? Because now when they get back on, all the other stuff, and now they're behind in that. And so the goal is, is balance, right? You want to be able to achieve a goal, but not disrupt too much of your life because you fall victim to your processes and your habits. Sometimes, again, to quote Ray Dalio, you need some radical transparency. And that's what I do. I coach folks individually, and they hire me to say, hey, help me get my goals. And I help them break it down and achieve it, and then I give them the radical transparency they need if it's too big, if it's unrealistic, or if there's other things that you're doing that you don't realize that are getting in the way, right? And it's funny, um, <clears throat> this is what consultants do. They evaluate the whole picture, and then they come in, and they tell you something, and when you get the answer, it's usually pretty obvious, right? But it's obvious to them because they have a big, grandiose, 30,000-foot, high-level flyby view where you are in the weeds, and it's, you know, you've heard the, <clears throat> the adage, it's hard to see the forest and the trees, if you will, right? So, you know, have someone that's outside that's a mentor, if you will, or just say, hey, I want to get here in three weeks, and you kind of hold me accountable. I'm going to tell you what I'm doing. Tell me some areas that may be some choke points and that may not work. And that's important, but um, not as important as you spending the time. I think you can do it for yourself if you have the self-awareness. Self-awareness to hit all four parts of your wheel is crucial. Here's the thing. If you're sitting there, you're watching this, you say, yeah, I'm self-aware. Well, the stats, the stats show that you're not. 90% of people say they're self-aware. Only 4% of people actually are. So the question should be, how do I increase my self-awareness? Because the one thing I believe to be true is all these successful folks that I've interviewed and worked with and analyzed and studied, they all have high levels of self-awareness. Again, 9 out of 10 people say they have it, but only a half a person, you know, 0.4% out of uh, right, 100 people have it. So if that's the case, how do you do that? You do that through meditation, which is increasing the gray matter in your brain makes you more self-aware. But how? A lot of folks will sit down and say, I don't know how to meditate or how to create more self-awareness. Well, there's this quote out there that I mentioned yesterday by Alan Watts, and it's a YouTube video that you can watch what is titled, What Happens If You Stop Talking to Yourself All the Time? And he said, Alan Watts, extremely bright thinker, look him up. Um, he had this saying as a boy that if there was someone who walked down the street and talked to themselves, they, they were mad, right? If they're constantly talking out loud to themselves, they were mad. Well, in our heads, we're always talking to ourselves all the time. So technically, by that standard, we're all mad as well, right? And if you're only talking to yourself, you're only living internally in this world, in your head of a world, instead of seeing everything that's out there. So meditating is just stopping this chatter in your head. Laying down, breathing, focusing on what you feel when your breath expands. Uh, go on YouTube. There's a, something called like the 61-point meditation. And it's guided meditation. It takes 10 minutes. And you get out of your head and you get into your body. Like, feel your feet on the ground. When's the last time you actually felt what it feels like to feel? I can feel the carpet beneath my toes. You know, I can feel this itch I have, you know, on my nose. I can feel... My, you know, my fingers, that is stopping the chatter here, putting the energy down here. And that's literally all you have to do. Do that for a few minutes each day. It increases the gray matter, increases the, the self-awareness, which helps you answer more strategically and transparent with yourself to say, is this goal realistic? Can I hit that goal? Am I balancing the other things? Once you bring all those things together, which is the three-week sprint, the self-awareness, the, what did you call it, test, reflect, and optimize? Yeah. Right? Once you do that, like you will hit your goals. And if you need some help, reach out to folks like us. This is what we're happy to do, right? Yeah. Send me a DM on, uh, on Instagram. Compliment. C A L M P L I M E N T Z. Um, this is what I do. You know, what's yeah. your, right? They got your contact information. I'm yeah, sure. yeah. You'll mine below. You will find everything in the video description, both my contacts and Joe's contacts. So I'll put it down there after this. Um, I think. I think it's really interesting with the, um, like how you how the thoughts are uh, how the thoughts are how do you say um, 
impacts what you do. Stops to become things, yeah, the yeah. power of your subconscious mind. Exactly. For sure. So that's that's like something I I was like twenty twenty two or something mm -hmm. when I actually learned how yeah. much it affects what I actually do and right. how I think about myself. Yeah. Like switching those negative thoughts to positive thoughts. How to do that, right? Yeah. So that's I think it's really interesting, but it's also it's one thing that. Uh, when you talk about goals, mm -hmm. that uh, setting down goals for yourself, and mm -hmm. I want to hear your thoughts about it because I think a big mistake is that people put, at least when I look at myself, I can put like goals that are result oriented mm -hmm. instead of like what is the effort that I need to do, what True. do I need to improve, and right. what the knowledge mm -hmm. that I want to have instead of what do I want to reach. Mm -hmm. So is that like uh, when you're helping others, is mm -hmm. it a big mistake that people do? Oh, yeah. So you have mean goals and ends goals. And this is one I got from uh, <clears throat> a gentleman that was interviewed on Impact Theory. But if you want to be successful, you break it down into three areas. One, you map first column. Write down all the experiences you want to have in life. Not goals, experiences. What you find, and I'm quoting the gentleman in TED Talk, and the name escapes me right now, is that your experiences that you thought were goals, experiences that you want to have, um, can be done with less money than you think, and usually they involve people. So for example, I had a guy who's like, hey, I want to make $750,000. I said, why? So I spend more time with my kids on vacations, things like that. Why? Because, you know, to me, that means success in that area of the wheel, if you will. I said, okay. Uh, do you need $750,000 to spend more time with your family? No. You can do that right now. His experience is, he wants to go out. I mean, you can go camping or do this or that. You don't have to have the money to do that. The experience is he wants to better the relationship, you know, with his kids, right? So that's an experience. Um, people are like, oh, I want, you know, 750000 so I can, you know, go on boating trips or cool vacations. You don't have to have that money to do that. And again, it involves people. So map the experiences that you want to have in life. Number first column. Second column, you look at all those experiences. Um, and then you say, where do you need to grow to have those experiences, right? So like if there's an experience that you don't know how to do yet, you need to do the things that we just mentioned to increase that skill set that you have to execute on that, to make that you know, expectation or experience become a reality. And then the third thing is fulfillment. The third column is once you get there, where do you want to give back to society? Because we're all looking for happiness, but not happiness, we're looking for fulfillment. And the way to do that is to help other people and give back. So if your area is film editing, you know, then once you map your experiences and grow in the areas that you do, I'm sure you're going to get to a point where you want to give back and teach other, you know, new folks coming up on how to do that stuff. And that's where we find the fulfillment. Um, I'll quote Warren Buffett on this one. So with the experiences, he puts people through like a 525 exercise. Again, you can find the YouTube on it. Map out 25 experiences you want to have in life and then rank them. 1 through 25, it's kind of obvious. Focus on 1 through 5, obvious. But the 5 through 25, or the 6 through 25, become your avoid at all cost list. You don't put any time into those things until one of those five have been done, and you can migrate that one off the list, and now you move a new one up the list. Again, we only have like three and a half hours each week, good three and a half hours to put towards our goals. And so if you're spreading that all the time over the 20, 25 things that you want to do, you're never going to get anywhere. So focus on your 1 through 25 to build your list, but then shrink it down to the 1 through 5 and focus on, which is obvious, but the 6 through 25 become avoid those things. And you would typically think, don't avoid those, but no, yes, they become avoided all costless until one of these five become habitualized or, you know, you can put the check mark next to them. And so with that, you know, <clears throat> I think we hit kind of most of it. We probably can call it a wrap here yeah. in a minute. There's a whole nother episode we can have on on the mindset piece and the meditation and doing some of that. I'd love to be on the show if uh, if you want to have another episode. I might yeah. be coming to Europe sometime. We could do something there That'd or even great. virtually as well. But any other closing yeah. thoughts before we wrap it up? Uh, I just got like an insight from what you just talked about with sure. the, the goals because I last year I put down like uh, my top 10 goals mm -hmm. and ranked them. Uh, so uh, I know like what's the goal that I want the most and what's number 10. Mm -hmm. And that's like something that I have uh, struggled with when I am really? uh, trying to create uh, habits for myself. Like mm -hmm. do I need to accomplish every mm -hmm. goal mm -hmm. on that list? Mm -hmm. But actually it's more focused on 
like the top five that you said. Out of way. That's what I'm talking so, about. Man. Yeah. So I learned something. Good. Cool. <laughs> something new. Good. Right. For sure. Uh, that I'm gonna implement. Nice. Uh, so. Nice. Yeah. So thank you so much for joining this live. This yes. Was, this thank, is great. Thank I you think. for having me. Yeah. For sure. Reach out if you need help. Yeah. This is what I like to do. I got a book coming out that I'm working on. It's part of my three week sprint. So hopefully that'll have uh, some of the insight that we talked about in here and expand on some of that um, stuff to uh, to help you you know level up your life. Yeah. So signing off. Right. All right. Perfect. Let's finish the rest of this Thanks day. for watching. Well, take care, folks. <laughs>